Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. Come on inside. We're going to get started with worship. Yes.
morning, Lincoln Glen. Um, I hope everyone is doing well today. Happy Palm Sunday. And in honor of Palm Sunday, we have a scripture reading for you today. So I'm going to read us a passage from Mark 11, and it's going to be on the screen as well if you want to follow along. And then after that, I'm going to invite our kids ministry up, and they are going to <coughs> recite a verse that they have been working on memorizing as well. Um, so exciting morning, and we'll get started with the scripture. <laughs> um, so Mark 11, 1 through 14. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, and uh, can you change the slide? Sorry. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever writ ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and we will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside the street, tied it at a doorway, and they untied it. Some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? Then ans they answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Okay, now we're going to have a special Palm Sunday reading from our kids' ministry. They've been working hard, so let's give them a round of applause as they come on up. Once again, the words will be on the screen if you want to follow along. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. John 6, 33. more that aren't here and these are some of our helpers as well and it's not even half of us we have a great crew they're amazing and uh, we take our turns teaching the kids each week and one of the priorities is learning Bible verses and so we've been working on this one for a few weeks and just wanted to share that with you if there is anyone who would like to work with children. You can work with us as a helper or a teacher. Uh, please see me, because we're always open to more help, okay? So thank you very much, and thank you kids. You did a great job. Let's give them one more round of applause. Oh, yeah. Good job, yeah. you guys. It is yeah, not easy great. to memorize scripture. They're so good. Thank you, helpers, as all. Well. Okay, guys, we're going to continue on with a couple of announcements. You guys can come back up. Um, <laughs> um, we're going to continue on with a couple of announcements now. Um, as you guys know, the long-awaited Easter weekend is coming up next weekend, and we have a lot that we are doing here at Lincoln Glen Church. 
Um, so we have three big events um, happening um, right here on this campus, starting with Good Friday at 7 p.m. right here in this sanctuary. Um, so if you know anyone who um, just needs some time to sit, think about um, God and worship, or maybe needs um, their spirit nurtured, um, that's what this um, Good Friday service is all about, is honing in and focusing in on Jesus and all that he did for us. Once again, that's at 7 p.m. And then we're going to burst into fun on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on this same campus in between these two buildings. Uh, we're having the Easter egg hunt, and it's for the whole community. So um, if you have any neighbors that you know have kids, this is a perfect time um, to invite them um, to church and enjoy having fun with the rest of the community. That is at 10 a.m. right in between these buildings. Um, and it's for young um, children all the way up to, I believe, early um, elementary, middle school. Yes, I believe we're doing that. So now we have um, Sunday morning, also at 10 a.m., right here in this sanctuary. We have our Easter Sunday service. Yay! Yes. Wait. <laughs> we have our Easter Sunday service. Ooh. Yay! There we go. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we're going to have some fun um, just celebrating one of the, the main reason why we're all here today, the main reason why we all have hope, and that is because Jesus is alive and well and loves us every day. Amen. He gave his life, but not only did he give his life and die, but he rose again, amen? And so we're going to celebrate that on Sunday at 10 a.m. right here. We're going to sing some songs and praise God together. So make sure you invite your friends and family to that as well. Um, Larry has one more announcement, and then he's going to introduce our offering. I do. Actually, I might have two. But um, on the uh, Easter egg hunt, one request. We can just all join together as uh, believers here. I, the weather says rain. So um, there is not a lot of alternatives for us if, if, if it is raining. So I think we'll just rain or shine, we're going to have that hunt. Um, and parents, you know, if you've got kids out there, you can, you know, dress your kids appropriately, bring your umbrellas, but I think we're, we're just going for it. Um, and, uh, but uh, that, that'll be a lot of fun. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, we, I think we still need candy, right? Uh, we have 7,000 eggs. Not 700, but 7,000. So and when you bring a big bag, you guys have been awesome bringing candy. They bring a big bag, um, it's like 100 pieces. That's great. Just need Even a few more. A few more. <laughs> uh, so uh, that, it is a lot. And a lot of people have been volunteering. Folks at the manor have been filling eggs. I know a lot of you, your families have been filling eggs. So um, think candy, candy, candy. Uh, it's not too late to, to help us and, and bring that. Also, if you want to stuff eggs, um, we do have um, eggs that still need to be stuffed with the mm -hmm. donations that we have received. So I'm um, happy to take volunteers. Michelle Franco, raise your hand. Did you? There she and is. Julie Michelle. Posey, raise your hand. Julie. Yes. So contact either one of us, and we will connect you with a bag of candy and some eggs because we need stuffers. That's yeah? right. Okay. I was lobbying with uh, Evelyn if they could just have everybody bring the candy to my house, but they said no. Uh -uh. So. Uh, you guys anyway. don't remember what happened last year. It's <laughs> yeah, bouncing off yeah. the wall. Shh. Um, so uh, the Friday after Easter, so, you know, we got a Good Friday service this week. We got the egg hunt. We have our Easter service, which probably will include baptisms, too. So um, we are going to do something uh, that we've been wanting to do for a long time. The Friday after Easter is April 5th, and right here in our lobby we're gonna roll out the popcorn machine, we're gonna have goodies and drinks, and you're all invited, but it is especially geared for um, people that have questions about our faith, and um, might be open to seeing something, uh, a movie that's sort of faith-based. So we're, uh, we're gonna start with a great, great film uh, called Risen, and um, we're gonna show it in our, our cafe, and make it nice and toasty, and, and so you're all invited. So it's a, a beautiful follow-up to the message of Easter, and um, if, if there are people in your lives that think, you wanna come to a movie? Um, th they might do it. Um, that, that's what this is for. And parents, it's probably this particular film is, is not 
for children. Um, it's, it's not gory or anything, but it's just probably not for kids. But it is for, for everybody else and um, for seekers. So there you go. And uh, again, uh, we're going to take our offering now as part of our worship. And it is uh, amazing, the generosity of Lincoln Glen Church. We, we want to encourage your continued giving as uh, God is doing things among us. Um, I think in weeks to come, you're going to hear more about our, our youth group uh, and probably a, a growing a, from there uh, into a college ministry. So anyway, good things are happening. You just saw some of our kids. Uh, let's continue to give so that we can be the light of the world here in San Jose. Lord, thank you that you provide all these things for us. Thank you that you take care of us. Uh, you've given us ability to, to get food, to, to have shelter, to, to even drive in cars. And, and Lord, just your blessings are amazing. And you've given us each other, this family uh, here at Lincoln Glen. Lord, I just pray that um, the love that you have shown to us, we can take that in and we can show that to others, not only here in our church, but beyond these walls into our community. And uh, God, just uh, pray that you will use this offering to that end. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Good morning. If you're new, my name is Tyler. I'm one of the pastors here at Lincoln Glen. Um, and if you were here last week, uh, I, I lost my voice and I have it like 98% back. So I'm going to give you 98% of a sermon today. So uh, last week, we were going to talk about what we're talking about today. We just moved it to today. So it's not necessarily the most like Palm Sunday esque sermon, uh, but this is how things went. So we are going to look at a story that many of us are familiar with. We're going to look at a story of a son who runs away from his father's house. He runs away from home, and then he returns back home, and most people are excited, but there's one family member who's not excited about him coming back. (laughs) Not the Lion King. It's also the story of the prodigal son. There's a lot of overlap in the story, but it's the story of the prodigal son that many of us are familiar with. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to talk about this story for the next two weeks. We're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about it next week on Easter as well. It's really one story, but there's two perspectives to it. And so uh, there's there's the perspective, the story of the prodigal son, which is what we mostly focus on when we talk about this story. But there is also, at the same time, the older brother in the story. He doesn't get talked about as much, but we're going to talk about him today. And so as we do, I'm going to, I want us to pray that God would just open up our our hearts and our minds, that we would hear what he has to say to us today. So you close your eyes, bow your heads with me. Lord, as we look at this story, which is familiar for for many of us, the story of the prodigal son. May, may you speak to us through this parable that Jesus gives to us and, and help us to see what you are trying to teach us as we look at the story of the older brother. Lord, may we be convicted wherever we need, we need to be convicted. Lord, may, we, may your word come alive to us. May you take uh, a story that may be old to many of us and, and make it come alive in fresh new ways today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at Luke chapter 15, and in that we see it says, Jesus continued, there was a a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now some of these details we will hit both this week and next week to try to understand the the story of both the son and the older brother here. But when the the prodigal son says, give me my share of the estate, he's, he's telling his dad, I wish you were dead. Because when do you get your inheritance? It's after your parents pass away. And so he's basically saying, like, I don't really care about you. I wish you were dead. I just want my inheritance now. And so the father actually gives him the inheritance and says, not long after this, the younger son got together all that he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. We don't know all the details of this, and now this is also, this is a, a parable that Jesus tells, so Jesus isn't necessarily telling us, here's a real life story of what happened. He's kind of saying, imagine this happened. He's saying, let me, let me make up a story and tell it to you to teach you a point, but so we see here that this, this son in this story has squandered his inheritance in wild living. And it was likely that his dad had a lot of money. We'll see later that his dad still had quite a bit of money to spend on a, on a party later. And so he probably spent a lot of money, just squandered it in what the Bible calls wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here am I starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. And I want you to think about how you would react if a prodigal came home to you. If if a prodigal in your life came home who had maybe like abandoned your family and said, I want nothing to do with you, I'm out of here, but then they come back. Because a lot of us always think about the, the joy we would feel 
But also there might be other feelings that you feel too. Like we need to talk about what happened. We need, like this was not okay what you did. What would you be feeling if a prodigal returned to you? And so I just want to think about like, what's our posture towards prodigals? Here Jesus is talking about, eventually we'll see, that he's talking about those who are really far away from God. And so what is our posture? What's our heart towards prodigals? Is it joy when they return? Or is it anger? I can't believe what you did. I can't believe the things you did that were wrong. Is it relief? Or is it concern like, hey, they're back. How's, that gonna deal? How's this going to affect the dynamic here? Is it forgiveness or is it punishment? And to think about, like, what's in our heart when it comes to prodigals? We see it says, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And so we see what the father's posture was. See, the father's posture was embrace. He said, Here's my son. I'm going to embrace him. Does that mean that everything he did was okay? No, but his, 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 his response, his posture was one of embrace for his son. He said that this, it says, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. So we see the response of the father is compassion. And then he said, let's also like, let's bring out the best of the best. Let's have the choicest meal. Let's bring you the best things to wear and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was essentially dead to his family. Not that his family rejected him, but he rejected his family. He said, I want nothing to do with you. And then he comes back and says, like, our son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And so we see the father's theology is that no one is beyond redemption. Here Jesus is telling this parable, saying, look, this is ultimately about those who are far from God the Father. The, fa the prodigal son represents those who seem far away from him and that they are not beyond redemption redemption that yeah they can go live the craziest life and, and sin the sins that you're like you shouldn't do those and god says no they can they can come back they are not beyond redemption and so we see in the heart of the father in the story of the prodigal son that people are not beyond redemption it says meanwhile the older son was in the field so think about this think about where he was and where, the, where his brother was okay so his brother has been taking the inheritance and, and just spending it and wasting it on wild living. Now, we don't know what the family knew about the prodigal son and his whereabouts and what he was doing, but there's probably a good chance that they would hear rumors of, of what he was doing. And so here is the prodigal son wasting away the inheritance over here after abandoning his family, and here is the prodigal brother, and what is he doing? He's working in the field can see maybe where some of the resentment comes from like look here i am i'm working in the field for the family keeping up the family business serving the family and here's my brother over here who's been wasting it all so it says the older son was in the field when he came near the house he heard music and dancing so he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on your brother has come home he replied and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound the older brother became angry, refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. So the brother is upset. He's like, look, I have been faithful. I've been serving the family. I'm doing all this. And then here's my brother, and he comes back after doing what he did, and we're going to throw him a giant party. So it says he was angry. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Like, I've been serving you all this time. I've been doing all this for you. And yet you've never celebrated me. You've never done this for me. But you do it for my brother who's wasted everything. But the son of yours, which is not my brother, the son of yours who has squandered uh, your property with prostitutes has come home. You killed the fattened calf for him. That would be like one of the choicest meals that you could, you could make. So we learn about the brother's theology here. He thinks, I've done the right thing, so God owes me. I've done the right thing, so God owes me. Look, I've been in the fields. 
I've been slaving away. Look, look at what he's done. You throw him a party. You owe me. Look, I've been going to church. I've been praying. I've been reading my Bible. I've been doing the things I'm supposed to do. God, you owe me. That's kind of the theology that he's holding here. Also, he, he kind of thinks like, I'm better than people who commit certain sins. There's no way that the prodigal brother, the older brother, was sinless, yet he looks at his brother and like, well, because he committed those sins, because he did those things, I'm better than him. Because he sinned in those ways, and I don't do that, I just sin in other ways. And so there's this idea of like, I'm better than my brother. And this idea that I care more about me than people's salvation. That he's like, I don't care that my brother's home. I just care like, about the fact that like, I'm not getting this recognition. I'm not getting this party. What's the, how is the dynamic going to change now that this guy is back? Not that I'm just, I don't care about the details. He's just home. He cared far more about himself than, his, than the well-being of his brother. And the, the theology of the older brother is caring more about myself than caring about people's salvation. This, the context that this passage is found in makes, makes the, the parable even more interesting. So it, it, in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 3, we see this is the context. This is who was there at the time. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. So here's the crowd that's there. You have the tax collectors and sinners, which is kind of a redundant phrase in that time, but the tax collectors were considered like the worst of the sinners. Like the, nobody liked them. The people that nobody liked, they also didn't like the tax collectors, okay? They, they were not liked. So you have the people that were far from God, the sinners far from God. Then you also have the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, those are the people, the religious leaders, that are supposed to be the ones that are closest to God. So you have the people that represent those that, should, that seem far from God. And then you have this group of people that, that seem to represent those that, that should know God and should be close to God. So Jesus is speaking to them. And with that in mind, you can kind of see, okay, as Jesus is talking about the prodigal son, he's talking about, man, here are the sinners and the tax collectors who everyone looked at, like, they're so far from God. And then talking about the, the older brother, man, here are the Pharisees and the tax collectors. He's speaking to them. And so we see he, he tells this series of parables, the, the lost sheep. We see, the, the, uh, we see here, we see the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Jesus is telling these parables about things and people that are lost, and those that love those things so much that they pursue them. And so we see these stories of a God who pursues his people no matter how far they are. But then in the prodigal son, we also see the older brother who can resent that. So the older brother represents like this Pharisee who seems close to God, yet at the end of the day, his heart's really not that close to God. It seems like he is, yet at the end of the day, he, you see his heart is not aligned with his father's heart. So at the end of the, the parable, this is the father speaking, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so we see the heart of the father. We had to celebrate because he's lost and found. And so the question that we think, okay, if we're focusing on the older brother, here's the question we should ask, right? Are we like the older brother? And I want to suggest that's not the question to ask. The question is not, are we like the older brother? The question is, in what ways are we like the older brother? It's really not a question of if. It's a question of which ways we are. See, the Bible is so full of speaking into and against the, the way the Pharisees lived. And I think sometimes what we do is we, like, we open the Gospels and we look and we read about the Pharisees. We're like, wow, they were terrible. And we move on. Like, I'm glad I'm not like that. And we, we, we've taken the idea of being a Pharisee and we've like simplified the idea of like someone who's a Pharisee today is just someone who's like overly legalistic. They just get so, so focused on these rules and they, they're fundamentalists. And we get so focused on that that we actually miss that I think it's so much more than that. And that I don't think Jesus spent so much of his ministry addressing the Pharisees, that scripture spends so much time addressing the attitude of the Pharisees, that it really was just for the small select group of people that existed in the time of Jesus, and we don't need to see it in our own hearts today, 
Yet, when the Pharisees come up, we are supposed to examine ourselves, say, in what ways is that evident in my heart? In what way am I like the older brother? Because it creeps into our hearts. We think, I'm not like that. I'm the prodigal son who, like, that's, my, that's my testimony, right? Like, I, I was far from Jesus and I came to know him, and, and that may be true too, but in what ways, as, as after you've come to know Jesus, in what ways does that attitude creep into your heart? See, the brother's posture was jealousy and anger. He felt unappreciated. He had really no concern uh, over the, the well-being of his brother. Yet the father's posture was embrace. Again, the brother's theology was, I've done things, so God owes me. You know, I've, I, I go to church, so like when I pray, Jesus owes me a response. Jesus owes me the answer to my prayer. Like, I'm, I'm asking for this, and he owes me that. You know, those people over there, they've committed that sin, and that sin's terrible. I've never done that, so I'm better than them because I don't sin in that way. Man, like, I, man, I just care about my preferences more than I care about the salvation of someone else. That's the kind of theology, the thinking that seeps into the mind of an older brother type of person. And here's the thing. We cannot change the heart of a prodigal, but you can change your heart toward a prodigal. We cannot, as much as we want to, as we have people in our lives who are far from Jesus, we cannot change their heart. God can use you to change their heart. God can, can use you as a part of that process of them coming closer to the Father, but ultimately you are not the one who can change their heart. Yet you can realize the condition of your heart and say, well, maybe I can change my heart toward a prodigal. And so I want you to think about as we examine, like, in what ways might I be like a, a, an older brother? I want you to think about, okay, someone comes in this building and they look or act differently. What's your heart in that? Maybe like, well, if they look and act within this box, that's okay. But the second they get out of this box that I consider acceptable, what they wear, how they talk, whatever, once it goes out of that balance, I feel very uncomfortable. It, does that creep into our minds? Okay, okay, I'll accept people coming in here, but once they, once they go out of my perceived ideas of what's okay, uh, maybe not. What if people that struggle with certain sins? Like, yeah, anyone can come in, but if they struggle with that, like, I don't know if this is a place for them. Does that come into our hearts, like the prodigal, like the older brother? Or someone who votes differently than you? What about the person who's like, who votes for that one candidate? That you're like, oh, no one can vote for that candidate. What if they come in? You know, what if it's the person who's abandoned or hurt you in the same way that the, the prodigal son abandoned and hurt his family? What if that person walks in? What about the person who just bothers you? Like, there's just, they, just, they just bother you. Like, there's no big reason they just bother you. What if, what if those people walk in? Where does your heart towards those people? Do you really want them to know and experience the love of Jesus? And so that's a question for, for us. Is, as people walk in, will we approach them as if we are like the older brother? Or will we say, look, I'm not the prodigal father in the story, but I want to have his heart. Because the, the, prodigal, the father and the prodigal son is God. So we're not him, but we are to approach them with that same heart that God has. And so for us as a church, as we live in a culture that has drifted more and more away from Jesus, when people do come in, they're not necessarily going to come in looking the way that you might want them to look or acting the way that you want them to act. And so as we, as we live in a culture where we're surrounded by people that, that are further from Jesus, are we going to be like the older brother be like, and have that, that pharisaical attitude? Or are we going to say, I want to embrace you and tell you to come in. It doesn't mean that the sin that's in that person's life is okay, but the, the posture of embrace, like come in and experience Jesus. And then Jesus will call them to a radical different way of, of living. I don't think the prodigal father was like, hey, come in and do whatever you want. But no, come in. You are loved. You are part of this family. And as part of this family, we are called to a radically different way of living. And that's what we see in Jesus as he explains what it's like to live in his kingdom. It is a radically different way of living. It is incredibly inclusive in the way, in the way that he invites everyone in. Yet at the same time, he says, but this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom. And so will we follow Jesus' lead on that? It's like, let's welcome the prodigals in. But also, we, we, you know, it doesn't mean like, okay, there's no such thing as sin. No, we just, we welcome them in and say, okay, come experience the love of the Father. Who draws people who are so far from him into his own heart? I was, uh, I worked at a church. Um, I've worked at a few churches before here, and one of the churches I was I was working at, 
Um, every church I worked at had, I was working with either junior high, high school, or college age. And so people would come talk to me about those age groups all the time. And so one person came up to me at this one church and said, man, I want this place to have so many more young people like the ones that you're working with. I was like, cool, yeah, me too. That's great. And I said, but I just, I just want them to come in and I just, I want them to come in and, 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 uh, and just worship like it was in the glory days here. I did, I'm paraphrasing, but like, you know, like I just want them to come in like, and come in and like sing the pipe organ and, and sing the old hymns with us. And I remember thinking like, yeah, I, you might have to choose like, what do you want more? Do you want the comfort of your preferred style of worship, or do you want to reach the, these, these young junior hires and high school students like you're talking about? Because I don't know if those two things are going to go together. And, and that was actually a church that there was a lot of resistance to that kind of stuff, and eventually had to go through some radical transformation, because there was a lot of attitude like, bring people in, but they need to experience Jesus in this, visit, this very specific way. Yet, if we want to be serious about reaching prodigals, we're going to have to go outside of our comfort zone. To reach people for Jesus, we often are going to have to go outside of our comfort zone. And so as we try to reach people from different generations, that's like a mission field. I mean, maybe it's always been this way throughout all of human history, but, but very true right now, that to, to go across generations almost feels like you're a missionary to a different culture, to a different country. And so will you go outside of your comfort zone to reach those in different generations, or different races? of different political views, different interests, different abilities, or a different history than your family? Will you go outside of your comfort zone to reach those people for Jesus, the prodigals that are found in all those facets of life? For us to reach prodigals and to be serious about it, to say, I don't want to be like the older brother. I want to be someone who goes and, and reaches prodigals. We need to pray for open hearts. It says it in Colossians 4 this way, devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should, that we would pray for the opportunities to reach out to prodigals and share the hope of Jesus with them, that we would truly seek to listen to prodigals as they're far from God. It's really easy to judge someone like, I can't believe this, this person is like so far from God and they're sinning in these ways. And then we get to know their story and realize the hurt and pain that there is. And realize, oh wow, the reason you had doubt is because you were really hurt by someone in the church. And you, now you have doubt because of that. You, you thought this way, you, you had these theological thoughts and, and maybe those weren't true. And when those came crashing down, you thought all of Christianity came, you thought all of Jesus came down with that. Or you read something that felt like contradicted itself in the Bible. You read something in the Bible and it's, you just felt like the Bible says this is sin and I don't think this is sin. And so whatever it might be, that Christians, they feel like are hypocritical. Will you just listen to the prodigals and hear their stories and journey alongside with them? You don't have to agree with them, but will you hear them out instead of judging? We come alongside prodigals like, tell me your story, let me listen. There's a lot of power in that. Will we love them? As Jesus calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves, will we seek prodigals in our life and say, I want to love you unconditionally. I want to show you the gospel. Maybe you won't listen to me present the gospel, but can I want to show you the gospel and my love for you? Show mercy to them. Um, in Jude, it says, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ were told. They said to you in the last times, there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. Which, if, does that sound like our times today? Which is true, because we you know what? It's like all times throughout all of human history. It was true when, when this was written, it's true now. There are those people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. I want you to like, hear that again. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy fixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And so the, the picture that's painted here, okay, those who doubt in your life, show mercy, be merciful to them. 
Don't judge them. Like, I can't believe you doubt that. I can't believe you wrestle with that. I can't believe you think. Be merciful to those who doubt. And then it gives this analogy of like snatching someone, saving someone from a fire. Like the, that's the, the, the weight and the seriousness of trying to reach prodigals is like, I, I want to save them as if they were in a fire. But at the same time, it says, okay, do what you can to go reach the prodigals who are, who are lost and who are doubting. But at the same time, don't, don't be so influenced by them that you then become, that you sin in the same ways they do. It says, hating even the, the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Like, show mercy mixed with fear. Like, I want to reach you, but I, I don't, I don't want to let you, like, you know, corrupt my way of thinking either. So it's like, I want to hold fast to what Jesus calls me to do. And part of what Jesus calls me to do is to go and to reach prodigals who are far from him, to show mercy. And so we live that out. And so we stand strong in the faith, show mercy as Jude said, but also stand strong in our faith in the meantime. And, and run to them if possible. And I don't mean like physically run to them if you're like physically able, but, but sometimes a prodigal will let you journey alongside of them in their life, and sometimes they won't. And if they will, will you run to them like, like we learn from the story of the prodigal father? Again, we are, we are not the father in the story. That's God the father. We take on his heart and say, okay, he had compassion. He would go to them. Can I go meet the prodigals in my life where they are and journey alongside of them? Can I come alongside of you and like, can I try to help be there for you as you have questions? Can I, can I, can I just walk with you and let you know that, I, that you are loved? Again, we see the story of the father, but while he was still a long way out, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. So we see the embrace of the father. So in what ways are we like the older brother? And that's not a fun question like, okay, how can I go love my neighbor? That's a more fun question. Like, in what ways am I like a Pharisee that Jesus often condemns? In what ways has that attitude snuck into my heart? Do I judge certain people because I think I'm better than because they commit those sins and I don't? Do, do I look at those who are far from God and just judge them? Do, do I hold some of these attitudes that the Pharisees had against other people? Do I hold those? Am I like the older brother who cares more about my comfort and my preferences than, than I do about the well being and salvation of, of other people around me? And so do, do I think also like the older brother, like, man, God owes me. God owes me because I did X, Y, Z. So in what ways are we like the older brother? And instead of being like the older brother, let's practice reaching prodigals. And so I want you to think of who is one person that you can bring with you to Easter next week. Who is one person that's like, hey, this is a prodigal in my life. Who can I invite? You know, we have a lot of things going on this weekend. We got the Good Friday service, which is not really an outreach-focused deal. Um, I remember last year, like, okay, this is very focused on, you know, for us as, as believers, and like, we're going to really focus on the sacrifice of Jesus, and expecting zero visitors, we had a lot of visitors, <laughs> and uh, I think it was a powerful time, and so if, if you think, hey, Good Friday might be a thing for one of the prodigals in my life, great, bring them to that. The Easter egg hunt, again, please pray for no rain. Two years ago, we, uh, we were setting up, it was raining, I got here, we were, it was raining, this, I don't like this. And then we are about to set up, and then the rain stopped, and there was actually a rainbow, which was very cool. And then we finished the egg hunt, we started tearing down, and then it started raining again. So, you know, however you want to pray, but anyway, uh, just, you know, we're going to pray. Whatever happens is God's will, but, um, you know, that's also an opportunity. We have some, we have some friends in our life who they, they're not, they're, they haven't been ready to come in this space here, in this rain. But they've been, they've been okay coming to, like, our block parties and our Easter egg hunt. So, okay, maybe you have people like that. Okay, bring them to something like that. And then Easter Sunday, the Sunday where we're going to share the, the hope of Jesus. We're going to share the, the flip side of this about the prodigal son, that because there's a Savior who died on the cross for us, we can have a Father who welcomes us home. And so we're going to share that. And so who can you be inviting to the prodigals in your life? And so be praying for that. Be praying about who can I bring as we have all these Easter things coming up. So let's, let's do it. Let's, let's spend a moment in prayer right now reflecting. Will you close your eyes with me? And let's just reflect on the condition of our hearts. Let's start there. Before we even pray for other people, let's just take a moment and reflect on the condition of our hearts. So will you spend a moment with the Lord and just reflect if you find 
some of the older brother attitude, some of the, the pharisaical attitude alive in your heart. And if you do, just repent of that. Say, Lord, I don't want that attitude in my heart. Lord, will you remove that from my heart? So will you just spend a moment with God reflecting on that? You spend a moment right now to just asking the Lord to lay someone on your heart that you can bring with you to one of the things that we have going on this weekend, Good Friday, the egg hunt, Easter Sunday morning, worship service, whatever it might be. Maybe it's even just a conversation that you have with a prodigal in your life who's maybe not ready to come to church, but just a, a conversation that you can have, a, a building a relationship with a prodigal in your life to seek to show them the love of Jesus. Will you just pray right now for God to lay some prodigals on your heart, that God will fill your heart with compassion for them, a longing for them to come to know the incredible embrace of the Father who loves his children, who sees no one beyond redemption, for you to have that same heart for them and for God to use you as a part of their process of coming back to the Father. So will you spend a moment just praying for that? Lord, will you help us to see the ways that our hearts are like the Pharisees, that they're like the older brothers, and the ways that we can judge other people, in the ways that we can think that we're better than others because they might commit a certain kind of sin that we just don't happen to struggle with, and we can think that we're better because of that, in the ways that we think you owe us because we think we've been faithful. Lord, will you remove the attitude of the older brother from our hearts? Will you help us to realize when it is there and to repent of it and to lay it before you and seek instead to have the same heart that you have? Lord, will you help us to have hearts for the prodigals in our lives, those that are far from the Lord? Lord, will you give us a heart for them? Will you open up their heart? Will you work in their hearts and their lives that the prodigals that we are thinking of now Someday may come to know you or come back to you after a long time away, whatever it may be. Lord, will you use us in that process? Lord, may we be a church that welcomes the prodigals here, a church that says we will journey along with prodigals as they seek to come back to the Father and walk hand in hand with them and show them this is who the Father is and he loves you and you are not beyond his redemption and this is what it looks like to live life with him. Lord, will you help us to be that, that, that church more and more? Lord, I appreciate and I love the openness and welcomeness of, of, of Lincoln Glen Church. Lord, will you help us to take that even further as we seek to reach more prodigals for you? So Lord, we, we pray this as we, as we lead into this, this weekend with all these activities. Lord, may they glorify you and may, may people be drawn closer to you. Lord, I pray that at the Good Friday service, people would just meditate and dwell on the incredible love of Jesus as he paid the price for our sins on the cross. Lord, on Saturday, may relationships be built with the families in our community that may ultimately lead to them coming to know Jesus. And on Easter Sunday, may the gospel be proclaimed clearly as it should, as Colossians say, and may the doors be open in people's hearts that they may hear the gospel and, and come to know the amazing news of Jesus. So Lord, we pray that you be glorified in all of this. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
this last song. If you need prayer, the deacons will be in the back of the sanctuary in the far back corners. If you need prayer, feel free to go to them and ask for prayer. We're happy to pray for you. Just like Tyler said, there's no big sin, there's no little sin. With the smallest lie, we're all equal. Whether it's addiction, fornication, love, lust, stealing, whatever it may be, we're all in here because God had to save us from something. So it's useless to pretend that God didn't save you from anything. I know for sure I needed help and need help every day. So we just encourage you guys with this next song to just draw near to God. it all and he still loves you.
Obviously, I wasn't planning on coming back up here. Um, I'm really grateful for people like Esther who have a very administrative mind and remember things that I don't. Um, so, uh, Easter lilies. We have this amazing tradition here at Lincoln Glen. Uh, we have on Easter Sunday, Easter lilies that we put out, and uh, you can dedicate them to someone. Uh, it could be someone that's passed away in your life, could be maybe someone who's not. But if you'd like to do that and continue that tradition, um, we've been forgetting to announce it, so here you go. Uh, you can grab one of these. Uh, Daryl has them in the back if you, if you need one. Um, and so you can grab one and just give it to a staff member, and uh, we'll have that next week for, for you. So it decorates our, our campus for, uh, for Easter. So that's one way to do that. And we also uh, have flyers in the back. Uh, if you want to take something and invite someone to one of the events we have coming up, we have those as well. So uh, Lord bless you, and we will see you next week as we celebrate Easter. Thank you.